Well, hello there, and welcome again to Gisborough Christian Fellowship. This week, we are looking at Jesus' trial before Pilate. And it's actually a series of trials between, before the Jews and between Pilate and Herod, but we'll come to that later. A famous picture of Jesus' trial in front of Pilate is this one. I always like a picture to show us a little bit of what was going on in the imagination, of course, of the, the painter. To help us understand the sequence of events all through, through Holy Week, um, the Bible Gateway produced this graphic, which I thought was rather good. Um, and I'd ask uh, Izzy if she can maybe send it out in, uh, in the weekly notices. Uh, and we are doing a deal with the bit, mainly with the bit between Jesus' arrest on Friday, which you can just see going up the top left-hand corner now, and when, uh, when Jesus is sent for, for crucifixion. One thing I want to say is, as we go through, as we go through this subject of Pilate's trial, um, we're not covering the crucifixion and the terrible death that that was. Uh, there's an enormous amount of mockery and beating going on, and a terrible lack of justice on on Jesus, on the King of Kings. And of course, today we haven't got enough time to look at the whole of Holy Week. I will say this, though, it'd be wrong not to take a moment to reflect on the terrible use of torture, beatings, leading to confessions, mock trials and executions that's happening now, right now, in all kinds of places throughout the world. And I'm not picking out Middle East particularly. I think we have to remember that in our prayer. So let's go to the background on Pilate. Pilate was a governor of Judea and Roman governors were there to ensure that the conquered nations of the Roman Empire stayed in line. Um, they were quite good at giving, um, giving nations their own freedoms. They could do what they wished. But the Roman governor's job was to be the chief judge, chief judge. He was the only person that could impose execution as a judgment. Um, he was also supposed to move around the province and delivering justice on a sort of mobile basis, a bit like judges used to in the olden days here. And if you wanted to appeal what a Roman governor decided, uh, as Paul found out, you have to go to Rome. So he's pretty much up there in terms of seniority. He also provided, he, he also commanded the military forces. He was able to put down uh, criminal gangs or rebellions, things like that. And of course, he had advisors and staff and, and stuff like that to keep him in his position. So his residence was Caesarea on the Mediterranean. You can see I've marked that on the map on the right. But he was in, in Paso, on the Passover. He was in Jerusalem to prevent trouble because many, many Jews would be gathering for this. And he stayed in a magnificent palace built by Herod the Great near the temple. Um, so he was quite, well, quite an important guest. And Pilate's role, really, is he tried to be neutral. He tried even to be fair. And the result of this, well, probably isn't any neutral ground. He's mentioned in the Nicene Creed, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. He never actually heard Jesus teach or saw a miracle as he did, although, of course, he was in his presence during the trial. So he tried to be neutral without success. And this was his area of governorship in, uh, in Judea. And then we have Herod. Now, Herod, Herod Antipas is the person who we're talking. He was a neighbouring governor. He was actually a Jewish king. And his headquarters were in Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee, as you can see also marked. And like Pilate, he came to Jerusalem because of the Passover, probably for different reasons, because it was a religious festival, of course, a Jewish religious festival. Let's just take a moment to get our Herods lined up. Herod the Great was the one at Jesus' birth. He ordered boys under the age of two to be killed. Then we've got Herod Antipas, who's the one under concern now. He was responsible for, with his wife, for killing John the Baptist. 
and Pilate sent Jesus to him, as we'll come to later. And then you've got Herod Agrippa, who was responsible for the death of James and had Peter thrown in prison. This Herod had heard about Jesus. He was really keen to meet him. So what about the Jewish leaders? Let's, let's paint the picture of where they are. Well, they were there. They were Jewish enemies. They were Jesus' enemies. They were constantly challenging Jesus and they were always losing. They had a common hatred of Jesus. It says in Matthew 22, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him, Jesus, in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. So they were ready in the final days of Jesus' life. They were trying to trap him and they were working together. They were very different parts of the Jewish society. The Pharisees, nationalistic, uh, despised the occupying Gentiles, hated Jesus because Jesus was exposing them, their hypocrisy, their formalism, their legalism, their greed, everything about them Jesus was uncovering. They didn't like it. The Herodians were linked to Herod the Great. They were formed when um, Herod the Great was around. When, and, and the Romans pointed Herod the Great as their puppet to be king of the Jews. So unlike Pilate, who wasn't a Jew, Herod was a Jew, and he was put there by the Romans. And they came to enjoy the benefits of collaborating with the Romans. And they really hated Jesus because it seemed to them he was going to make a popular uprising, which then the Romans would put down, and that would mean that their power would be taken away by the Romans. The limited powers they had would be taken off them. The Jewish leadership in, this, in these passages is um, very much as follows. It's got three main groups. It's got the chief priests, which included obviously Caiaphas, the acting chief priests, more than one, and his father-in-law Annas, who was a former high priest. And then you had the lay members of the Sanhedrin, and then you had the teachers of the law. And those groups are mentioned pretty much consistently in each, each passage where they come into mention. All three groups, plus or minus all the time, are there. So let's go through the sequence of events. And this is the sequence of events leading up to Pilate's trial. First of all, there was a plot to kill Jesus secretly by these leaders we've just talked about. Now, Jesus had been teaching very publicly and he was a sensation. You don't get a crowd of 5,000 people on a mountainside in a semi-desert country, even today, without some effort, without some significant draw. I mean, for one thing, as the disciples pointed out, how are you going to feed them? But Jesus managed it, didn't he? And then he'd ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey with a very large crowd. And it says in Matthew 21, the whole city stirred. Then he clears the temple and he goes back to the temple and continues teaching. And they were, it was that public that the Jewish leaders were pretty much publicly out trying to entrap him. So here they have a problem with Jesus as they see it. And they get together, chief priests and elders this time, at Caiaphas Palace. They decided to arrest him in some way kill him. And Caiaphas said, better that one man dies than the whole nation. How true he was, but not in the way he meant it. And it's exactly what people do these days in some of these nations. What they want to do is they want to take people out of sight and then literally dispose of them. And they decide to Delay action until after Passover. They were afraid of the people. So they met together to do this plotting at Caiaphas' palace. But they were scared of the people. Public opinion mattered even then. And they wanted no one to see their evil. And they honestly believe no one will see their evil. Which is pretty ripe for a religious leader, really. And then something happens to their advantage. Judas offers to betray Jesus. And Judas asks, what do you happen to give me? And they were happy to give him 30 pieces of silver, the, life, the, the price for the life of a slave from Exodus 21. 
And clearly it makes you wonder that the Jews, could they not find Jesus? And also, they completely, having just decided to delay till after the Passover, here was someone happy to do it immediately and they completely changed their minds. Just shows how determined they were to get their result. Judas, Judas went to owe his money and watched for an opportunity. Then we have a bit of a brink of a bit of a normality slips in here. Jesus sends his disciples off to find the upper room and they find it. And there it is. And the Last Supper is held there. And Judas is revealed by Jesus. Staggering event, really. And Jesus leaves the supper, leaves the supper and goes out. And it was night, it says in John 13. And also the Last Supper, other than the Eucharist, of course, Peter, Peter's denial is predicted by Jesus. And then they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus prayed, Thy will not mine. And he's overcome with sor sorrow. And the disciples sleep. And he comes back to them several times to rouse them. He comes back to them three times. And then things hotting up. We get the arrest by the crowd. And I thought this was interesting. Chief priests, elders and temple guards, it says in Luke, muscle and authority. This was not ragtag and bobtail. This was not the local drunks and the local thugs. Chief priests, elders and temple guards. And of course, Judas knew where to find Jesus and kissed him to indicate who he was. And Jesus questions why they come with swords and clubs. Did I, am I leading a rebellion, he asks. And he also stops the bloodshed of an ear because one of his supporters has cut somebody else's ear off. He heals the ear. Isn't it amazing that Jesus found the time to do a miracle, to heal in the middle of his arrest? He also says something very startling. Do you think I cannot call on my father to provide 12 legions of angels? So he's arrested. He's first taken to Annas, who was Cyphus's father-in-law, as you remember. And he was a former high priest, and he tried to get Jesus to admit to false teaching. And he ends up having Jesus struck and sends him to Cyphus. And almost every one of these encounters, encounters you see, I'll put them in highlights here. Every one of these encounters, Jesus is struck. He's struck many times from here on in. So they take him to Cyphus and then the Sanhedrin. And the, everybody was, was there. This is the amazing thing. They took him to Anas and then they took him to Cyphus and the Sanhedrin and they were all assembled. It was the middle of the night. The trap had been well prepared and the whole Sanhedrin was there, it says in Mark. Two sects, the, San, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which really only form 10, 20% of the whole Jewish population were responsible here. And they had up to a 71 member of the greater Sahindra present here. And they were looking for false evidence. So they're pressing Jesus. but And they're looking for, for people to stand up and say, but none of the statements would agree. Then it says two came together. He said he could rebuild the temple in three days. And even then, they couldn't agree. But it's only been days before that Jesus had said this. And then... Carpus steps in. He says, I charge you under, under oath. Tell me if you are the Christ, the Son of God. To which Jesus replies, yes, it is as you say. And that's enough for them, isn't it? The high priest tears his clothes, blasphemy. And then an interesting encounter. He turns to the rest and says, what do you think? Well, if that's not leading the audience, I don't know. Semblance of justice. He's already said what was going to happen. And then the whole Sanhedrin agreed, all 71 of them. Now, that's a miracle in itself, isn't it? To get 71 people to agree on anything. But they agreed. They tied, pronounced Jesus guilty. They tied him up and sent him to Pilate. And at this moment, the cock crows. And Peter remembers what Jesus has told them about denial. 
So they took Jesus to Pilate, and it says early, and this is first thing in the morning. Absolutely, the cock has just crowed. Straight in. Um, and the whole company went. Everybody went. Quite a crowd still. Judas now sees what's happening to Jesus, as if he couldn't work it out, but now he really sees it. He feels remorse. He says, I have betrayed innocent blood to the chief priests and elders. Their reply? What is that to us? And Jesus kills himself. Judas kills himself. So now we come to the Pilate trial. And they play Pilate right from the outset, to use that expression. They play him. First of all, Pilate has to come outside so the Jews don't become unclean for the Passover. And uh, they say things like, Pilate's questions, why they brought him, he said, well, if you were not a criminal, we would not have handed him to you. To which Pilate replies, take him yourself and judge him by your own law, your own law. And they say, but we have no right to execute. They have already decided. Jesus himself gave no answers to the chief priests or the elders. And Pilate was amazed at this. So he said, are you the king of the Jews? He asks Jesus. Jesus says, yes, it is as you say. And Pilate says, I see no fault with this man. So Pilate now sends him to Herod. And on the basis that he started in Galilee, he sent him off to Herod because as we've seen Herod is the governor of that region. And he'd want, been wanting to see Jesus for a while. He wanted to see a miracle, some sort of a court magician, I guess. And he plies him with many question, questions. Jesus did not answer. And it got me thinking, you know, people who ask questions haven't always got a right to an answer. In this case, they didn't. What, what purpose are they asking these questions? And of course, the chief priests and teachers were there as well, and they were accusing. And, uh, and Herod really encountered Jesus as most vulnerable. But he wasn't, he wasn't impressed, if I can use that word. And he and his soldiers mocked Jesus, put an elegant row on him, and sent him back to Pilate, it says in Luke 23. And here's an interesting thing. Pilate and Herod became friends that day. They had been enemies. Wow. What a basis of a friendship. Jesus is now back with Pilate. The trial resumes. And Herod, I'm sorry, Pilate tries very hard to proclaim he's innocent. He says he's innocent. Neither head found, you know, found him guilty. I will punish and release. That didn't work. Then he tried to get prisoner release to work. And release, release Jesus, but the but the um, the crowd wanted Barabbas, Barabbas released instead. And Pilate tries t several times. What evil he's done, and he gets crucify him back from the crowd. And his wife piles on the pressure, and she says, yeah, "I have nothing to do with this innocent man, for I suffered many times today because of a dream of him." And eventually, Pilate, still being played, if you let me, this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anybody who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. But eventually, he sees he's lost it. And he washes his hands. He demonstrably says he's not responsible. And the crowd say, let his blood be on us and on our children. They wanted the injustice at any price. And Jesus was led away. So let's try and pull this together and summarise this. So we know a little bit about Judea's position. Yeah, Rome's conquered were, generally speaking, treated as equals. Um, and as long as they pay their taxes, of course, and there was some deference to Roman gods. And the Jews had won an, a bit of an accommodation from a previous emperor. Um, but there were obviously still tensions in periodic revolts. You, you know, see Bar Barabbas above. 
And on the right, you can see a stone, and this is a stone that shows that the the, the fact that Pilate was uh, was there at the time, and it's a stone that comes from the Tiberium, which is a temple dedicated to the Roman Emperor, and mentions Pontius Pilate dedicating it. And Pilate tries to be neutral. He tries to be a good governor. He um, he's dividing things between Roman and Jewish. Anything that is is religious he's passing back to Herod or so he thinks and the Jews are pushing the other way as hard as they can they say accused um, Jesus of opposing paying taxes we can see above is rather important and the opposite was true Jesus said give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God and Pilate was quite happy that Jesus was king of the Jews he didn't have a problem shall I crucify your king and the chief priest said we have no king but Caesar being played again and then he washes his hands but actually he let murderers off he lets two sets of murderers off he lets the Jewish leaders who just want a way to commit the murder they want to they want to commit and he lets Barabbas off Barabbas was a murder maybe not proven in trial but he was locked up because of because of his uh, because people thought he was a murderer got off scot-free. So in conclusion, what are the learning points for us to remember? And what are the learning points for us on the next slide? Well, numbers of people came very close to the truth. Pilate even wrote a sign. Here is the King of the Jews that was put on top of the cross of Jesus. And he was asked to change it and he wouldn't. But he didn't have the conviction, did he, to go through with the release of Jesus. Caiaphas and Annas, especially Caiaphas prophesying that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. It was there, right in front of him. But he couldn't see it. Pilate's wife, disturbed by a dream, that innocent man. They all came very close to the truth. And really thought very much about the power of the crowd, although they were groups of Jewish leaders and they obviously knew each other. They weren't, as I say, any person. But what a lot of power they had. They were there throughout the night. They were there egged on by people that were, you know, had a joint hatred of Jesus. How they must have hated Jesus to stay up all night, quite frankly. And they made judgments. They took decisions. And actually, in the end of the day, they won, didn't they? Because Jews' crucifixion showed that the Jews had power to order executions by proxy, if you like. They'd found a way. And Jesus could have extracted himself at any point. He'd just raised Lazarus from the dead. Many more were to follow at his own resurrection. My kingdom is not of this world. He showed them that he was about healing right at the point of arrest. So what are the learning points for us in conclusion? Have we reached the truth about Jesus? Or are we just very close? Are we listening? You know, it's a funny thing. It's just there's a trait among humans, isn't it? We don't listen to those that we know love us, that we know have our best interests at heart. We're much more tempted to listen to scoundrels, to conspiracy theories, to all kinds of things that have very little basis, in fact. And I'm looking at pilots here in terms of reaching the truth. He's a governor. He must have had a very middle-class life. He had power. He linked to the most powerful man on earth. He had a wife, a house, a household, food, income, status, people that worked for him. He lived in a period of peace. He had cause, dare I say, to be satisfied or to be smug. Do we? Pilate could afford not to engage. Do we? Secondly, what we see here is following the crowd is no good. Yeah, Anything can be ridden by shouting untruths. At least we should have learned one thing in the last year. And if that's it, that's enough for me. In our truth, in our, in our logic, we've got to be careful, haven't we? 
not be egged on by the people we're comfortable with. Yeah. We've got to be careful who we select as our friends. On what basis are we friends? And the third point, Jesus could have extracted himself, but he didn't. He didn't because he chose to suffer for our sins so that we might be reconciled with God. He could have extracted himself from this whole incredible episode, but he didn't. Hand washing at the end of the day is no good. There are too many things we cannot stand aloof from. It's great in the sense of COVID, of course, let me just be clear of that, but that's not what we're talking about. Hand washing in Pilate's sense is no good at all. I want to finish with what Jesus said. You are king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me.